Good afternoon. I'm Michael Lomi, the chair of the Asian American Research Center, or ARC, and it's truly my pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation on COVID-19 and its economic impact on Asian American businesses, workers, and the community in general. The mission of ARC is to support interdisciplinary research to help us understand and reflect upon the status and experiences of diverse Asian American ethnic groups and to advance their concerns and their issues. In the current period of dramatic and often troubling social change, it's very important for all of us to think about how Asian Americans are situated in the broader context of race, racism, and racial justice in the United States and in the world. It's clearly evident, for example, that the COVID-19 pandemic has deepened and exacerbated racial, gender, and class disparities with respect to healthcare, employment, and access to state resources. But in this regard, how Asian Americans are faring during this pandemic are often ignored by the mainstream media and data analysis on this population are fairly scarce. So we hope to correct this situation this afternoon uh, with today's presentation on Asian Americans, on race and economic disparities. I've known uh, our two esteemed presenters for a long time and have learned a lot from them about the use of quantitative data, about varying research methodologies and about policy analysis. Don Marr is professor emeritus of UC, uh, uh, is, is emeritus professor of economics at San Francisco State University. Uh, professor Marr's research and writing has focused on Asian Americans in the labor market, immigrant labor issues, and labor market discrimination. Paul Long is research professor at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs and the director of the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge. His research focuses on urban spatial structures, uh, race and economic inequality, and labor market disparities. Both of them have written extensively on all these topics. And with that, uh, let me now turn over to them for their talk on COVID-19's employment disruptions to Asian Americans. So thank you both Professor Marr and Professor Ong. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, let me just uh, thank Michael for, of course, uh, being able to have us there. Thank the Institute, thank ARC. Let me see if I can change the view of this particular. Ah, no. <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm having a technical issue with getting the right screen because now I lost my slides. <laughs> Can you guys still see them? No. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Um, while, while, while you're getting set up, maybe I could say a few words. Sure. So the research that uh, Professor Moore and I have been doing essentially started off in terms of trying to understand since March, the impact on Asian American businesses and workers using a number of data sources. Uh, Don has been the main driving force behind this and it's been my privilege to work with him. All right, now can you see the slides? Hopefully everything is all right. Uh, again, as Paul pointed out, actually Paul has been a driving force with the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge on trying to get at some of the issues that come about from this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, as uh, I once studied economic history for a long time and uh, economic history says this is gonna be one of the kind of signature events of the period. So we wanted to get some uh, uh, ideas or some material out about this particular pandemic in a kind of a quick research brief uh, presentation as opposed to a kind of regular academic article. So today's presentation, uh, first part of it 
is based on our uh, research brief, which is actually coming out in uh, AAPI Nexus in the uh, near future, something like in the next two weeks. But we also wanted to update it and kind of give a view of what's going on currently. So the first part of the presentation, which now I can't get it to go. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, deals with uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, research brief that we put out, that's the immediate economic impacts of Asians. Uh, then we wanted to kind of update some of the stuff with some of the material that both of us have been working on. And then we'll just close with some remarks and then take some. Most of us have seen this type of diagram before. This is a picture of the COVID cases since the pandemic began at the end of March, and yeah, I tried to update it to the present to the end of November. And the, the reason that we put this up there is to get to remind people of kind of the timing of uh, the pandemic. We note that at the end of March, beginning of April, we started to see this uh, initial increase in COVID cases. And that uh, we note that at that time we had the shelter in place uh, kind of uh, pronouncements being put into place across different states. Again, it wasn't a coordinated event, but we know that by mid-April, many of the states had implemented some type of shelter in place and then on the national level. As a result, we can look at some of the impacts on Asians from that initial uh, shutdown. And then we want, of course, follow it up with uh, kind of something on, about what's going on presently. We see that uh, overall that unemployment increased rapidly uh, from February through March through April. Uh, if you look at our chart, February unemployment rate, the official rate was about three to 4%. In March, we started to implement some of these shelter in place arguments and it started to creep up to the four, four and a half percent. Now, we also, Look, wanted to look at something called joblessness. And joblessness is people who lost their jobs, but might not have been counted in the official unemployment figures. Um, I talked to Paul briefly about this and for non-economists out there, where do we get the unemployment rate from? We get the unemployment rate from, from this monthly survey, uh, 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 current population survey or CPS survey. And from that, we get the uh, unemployment rates. But to be counted as unemployed, you have to kind of go through this protocol of different things. Were you working at all, even one hour during the uh, reference week? Were you uh, have a job, but not at work? These types of things. And as long as the world is fairly stable, the unemployment numbers tend to be fairly comparable across uh, time. However, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about amongst economists about during this COVID crisis, how reliable some of these figures are. So when we look at the unemployment rate, we're noticing that there's a, a, a lot of different things going on in the labor market that may uh, kind of understate the level of unemployment in the economy. So we created this thing called the jobless rate. And, and we do that by looking at the change in the size of the labor force from uh, February through the month that we're trying to reference. So for example, if we look at the chart, that first blue column, that March joblessness rate, that includes the regular unemployment rate and then the change in the labor force as people uh, kind of it in some senses drop out of the labor market or are discouraged or have to deal with childcare issues and so forth. And so we note that it jumps up by uh, a bit up to about five and a half percent. But then going on to April, the official unemployment rate in the United States goes up to almost 15% is 14.7. But we also noticed that using that same measure of joblessness that the jobless nation joblessness rate jumps up to almost 20%. Again, some economists looking at some of the uh, understating of the unemployment figures for this period of time argue that uh, it could be anywhere from a half percent higher than the official rate to 
maybe 5% higher than the official rate. So as you can see, the impact of uh, the COVID pandemic was quite severe in terms of unemployment. These are also kind of uh, charts that you've probably seen again and again, looking at in unemployment insurance claims. We see that they jump up from initial claims from about 200,000 in January and February to several million by um, April. You can see that this is a, a, a large increase. And the other part of the graph is continuing claims. People can file for unemployment. That's the initial claims. And then people who continue on in unemployment are the continuing claims. Again, I put that little uh, blurb at the bottom. It says not all workers are eligible for UI. Not everybody, uh, not all workers can collect unemployment insurance. For example, if you're self-employed, uh, if you uh, said, okay, I'm not even going to look for a job this week during that reference week. These things say, okay, I am uh, not going to be considered uh, eligible for UI. Sorry, did I say the part about uh, not looking for work in that period of time? Uh, that's more of the how we count unemployment. But there are other things, reasons why not everybody is eligible for unemployment benefits. Uh, now, wanted to turn to looking at Asian Americans and, and the impact having that larger story look at the unemployment and joblessness as we did before for the entire economy, uh, looking at UI claims, same thing, and then uh, looking at some of the reasons why perhaps unemployment amongst Asian Americans is a little bit higher than we expected. So here we have that same uh, graph, except now we have Asian Americans particularly compared to uh, non-Hispanic white unemployment rates. Again, similar story. We note that January and February, that the unemployment rate is relatively low, around 3%, and Asian American unemployment rates are actually very comparable at this point in time. We see an increase in March, but we see a dramatic change, I think, in April and May. One, we see that the unemployment rate of Asian Americans goes up tremendously, up to about 18%. And if we look at the joblessness rate, uh, we can see, oh, sorry, Keep looking at the wrong graph as usual in my world, uh, that we see that the, the Asian American unemployment rate has increased up to about 14% in April and then remains actually fairly high in May. Joblessness rates kind of follow the same idea. And we see that the, the Asians are, are experiencing a, a, a lot of unemployment rate in this period. Um, and again, the joblessness rate, we uh, calculate by looking at that change in the labor force. All right, moving on. Uh, this is something that Paul did a lot of work on and I, maybe I'll, I'll turn some of this discussion to Paul, but Paul was looking at uh, unemployment claims, which uh, the data is not really readily available. So uh, Paul actually worked with some other uh, uh, data from various programs in California and New York. Maybe Paul has something to say at this point. So one of the things, unemployment insurance is one of those programs that really is supposed to help workers during temporary spells of an un un unemployment, particularly if they're not responsible for the unemployment. That is, they didn't quit. Uh, they didn't uh, make a voluntary separation. Historically, unemployment insurance covers only about half of those unemployed. Uh, that's changed during the pandemic. We see huge numbers applying for unemployment insurance. And one of the things is that it's consistent with the current population survey. When we look at the unemployment insurance claims for two states, which breaks it down by race, Asians grow in terms of their share of the unemployment insurance. Another way to think about this is that they are growing much faster to get a much larger share of the unemployment insurance. Uh, other research, more current research that we're doing right now uh, shows that the claims there uh, don't always translate to actual benefits. And you saw that partly in the discrepancy in terms of the uh, lines that Don showed earlier uh, our best estimate is probably a uh, third to a half who applied. 
do not get unemployment insurance. In comparison of Asians who are applying to non-Hispanic whites who are applying, Asians have a lower probability of actually getting the benefits. So nonetheless, we do see in this data that unemployment, whether we're measuring it by the labor market measures that Don talked about, or by unemployment insurance, un unemployment among Asian is growing much faster than the whole labor market, and certainly faster than non-Hispanic whites. It sort of, in some ways, flipped the relationship of where Asians are within the labor market as measured by displacement and unemployment. Oh. <laughs> so here's, uh, we can run through this very quickly. So here's uh, just looking at New York. Uh, this is for the whole state of New York. Uh, you can see this sort of really ramping up. Uh, particularly during the early time periods. And other research shows, and I could talk about that a little bit later, that a number of Asian American businesses got hit harder, got hit faster and earlier. And that translates, uh, in our opinion, to this rapid growth in terms of unemployment. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just another way of measuring it. But here, we're trying to understand among Asian Americans, you know, who's really affected by the pandemic? And this is broken down by levels of education. And what you see is that where the impact is most uh, dramatic is among those with only a high school education or less. We know from other research, this is made up primarily of immigrants. Uh, particularly immigrants who come here uh, as refugees. They come here through family reunification rather than occupational uh, categories. So Asians are hit hard and it is particularly concentrated at the bottom end, the low wage workers. Next. Um, that's you, Don. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we want to try to understand why the unemployment rates for Asians have shot up uh, in, at the end of March and beginning of April. And part of our story, which is a story that's been put forth for other groups, of course, is that, uh, that many of the industries that employ Asians uh, were hard hit by the, the shutdowns. Of course, the, the most uh, visible one is the hospitality and leisure area. The other ones are retail and this other type of industry sector, which we call other services. Other services are more along the lines of uh, personal service uh, jobs and, and businesses. These include such things as uh, the kind of nail salons, the, the hairdressers, uh, the cleaners, domestic uh, cleaning, these types of uh, uh, businesses. And so we know that these businesses were hard hit by the closures. Again, as here in, the, in this slide, we're looking at the, uh, the uh, employment of Asians compared to non-Hispanic whites in these industries. And we see that uh, Asians have a higher levels of employment in those industries compared to non-Hispanic whites in the hospitality and leisure and other services. And they were close in, in terms of uh, percent employment in retail. So in terms of uh, industries that were hard hit, Asians were hard hit in terms of the hospitality and leisure industries and other services. Something on the order of one in four Asian Americans are employed in these three industries. And again, hospitality and uh, leisure actually had a severe impact uh, with uh, employment in that sector dropping by 49%, almost half by the end of April. If we look at the unemployment rates with in these industries, we see that initially uh, they're kind of uh, red and, and dark blue uh, columns. They represent uh, the uh, unemployment rates in these industries of Asians and non-Hispanic whites. And again, you can see that they're under 5% in February. But by April, we see a dramatic increase in, in terms of some of the industries in terms of the unemployment rates. And we see that 
Asians uh, have higher unemployment rates in these industries compared to non-Hispanic whites. So part of the story about why the unemployment rates for Asian Americans increase so much, we believe is partly due to the industries that people are employed in. Now we do have some cautions, uh, maybe people are not familiar with the current population survey, but they interview something like ooh, a, a couple, a, 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 between 100 and 200,000 people. But if you think about the percentages it, that are Asian, then it drops. And then when you think about the numbers that are in specific industry, then the numbers drop. So we're talking that these numbers are based on samples of you know about 100, 200. So there's some caution in looking at these numbers. I, I would, if you don't mind, I would also like to add the other industries includes, for example, the nail salons, uh, some of the other sectors where uh, Asian Americans uh, are a niche and they sort of occupy best estimate, for example, in nail salon is 80%. And that other service is also dominated by you know, beauty shops and so forth. And these, again, are industries that Asian Americans, as well as other people of color, are concentrated. And so you see this sort of real heavy disproportionate impact across sectors, but it translates because of the over-concentration of people of color and Asians into much higher unemployment for those who are working in those sectors. We, uh, we're also concerned about it. In fact, this is related to the previous slides in terms of the industries that Asian Americans find employment. But we also know that uh, Asian Americans are, employ each other. And we did looked at the impact of the pandemic on Asian American small business. Now here is a, a moderate technical aspect to it. Uh, we talked earlier about some problems with surveys and, and uh, how well they're measuring uh, what we would like to see during this pandemic. And so here I give uh, a, a figure kind of depicting the change in Asian American small businesses uh, in March and April from February. Now, I, you know, I'll explain this a little bit. In the uh, CPS, there's a question about were you self-employed? It asked actually a little bit more detail about whether you are self-employed in an incorporated or unincorporated business. But it also asks a question about whether you were in fact doing anything during the reference week uh, in this particular business. In fact, were you even there? And so we tried to calculate the change in Asian American small business by looking at whether people were self-employed and whether they were actually at the business during the particular reference week in the current population survey. And so the first two columns for March and April represent counting the uh, number of, or change in small businesses uh, using the, the uh, self-employed question, but also adding to that, the, the number of people who said they were self-employed but weren't at the business. So March, it looks like there was an increase of about 10% for both uh, Asian Americans and non-Hispanic whites. But then using that kind of second definition where we pull off those people who were not at work at that period of time, this is also an issue as part of the uh, counting of unemployment, we see that there's a drop in uh, both Asian American and non-Hispanic white uh, businesses. If we look at the April columns, we see that, that there is a dramatic drop for Asian Americans during this particular period of time. And uh, using that second definition where we don't count those people not at work, that it's estimated that something on the order of 28% of Asian American small businesses were closed during the month of April. And this is the, the number that seems to get people's attention, a drop of about 233,000. During that same period of time, white small businesses fell by over 
we are a little concerned about the size of these estimates, but it turns out that these estimates are actually very close to uh, actually a colleague of mine at that UC Santa Cruz named Rob Fairley, and he was doing a lot of work on small businesses and different uh, ethnic and racial groups in them. And he kind of comes up with the very similar numbers to the 28% uh, drop in the fall of about 233,000 businesses. This is yeah, something and that I, Paul and I are gonna work on some more. Yeah, and I just wanna add uh, this echo. I just wanna add that uh, given the data limitation, we tried to triangulate with more than one data sources. And so uh, in another research project using what we call big data. These are telephone, smartphone, locational data that tracks where you're at. Uh, it tracks you throughout the day, throughout the week. But we took advantage of that information to look at, for example, what happened in Los Angeles Chinatown. And so what we see is that there was a dramatic drop in traffic, business traffic to Chinatown that corresponds with the CPS. Matter of fact, what we find is that the drop occurs earlier. And by the time of the lockdown in mid-March, the drop becomes particularly pronounced in Chinatown, much steeper than in other areas. So given the limitation of any data source, uh, we've taken a strategy, again, of relying on multiple data sources to see if we come up with a consistent story. And the consistent story seems to be that uh, the pandemic hit a number of Asian American businesses earlier, uh, and that when the lockdown came about, uh, it affected these businesses in a much more profound way. That is, more businesses lost traffic compared to non-Asian American businesses. Moving on, uh, we know that Asian Americans are concentrated in certain parts of the United States. So here we're looking at unemployment rates across different states. And looking across, you notice a couple things. One, you notice that the unemployment rates varied uh, across the states. And, and uh, you also notice that whether Asian Americans did worse or better compared to non-Hispanic whites also uh, is more varied looking across these kind of major states that uh, Asian Americans reside in. Uh, probably the more dramatic one, of course, is the Hawaii one, which is a little bit cut off on my display. But you can see that the unemployment rates, which in Hawaii were extremely high. Again, that, that hotel, uh, rest, uh, the hotel, restaurant, leisure management type uh, areas of the economy were hard hit in Hawaii. Uh, here, that we wanted to look also at what's going on. So I wanted to move forward and kind of update what we see in some of the more recent data that we've been able to look at. So we'll look again at unemployment. Uh, we'll look at uh, some of the uh, recovery or non-recovery of certain industries that employ Asian Americans. And we'll talk a little bit more about Asian American small businesses. Here are, are, of course, the official, I put the official in little quotes, we, because uh, of uh, unemployment rates from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics takes that CPS data and calculates the quote official unemployment numbers for the United States. What we see from this is that there is a large difference in Asian American unemployment rates compared to non-Hispanic whites up until uh, the November numbers, that difference was actually pretty large, anywhere from two to 3%. And you can see that uh, during the months prior to the pandemic, that Asian American unemployment rates were really low. And in fact, uh, very close to that of non-Hispanic whites. But it, with the onset of the pandemic, that, that difference uh, we see of two to 3% seems to persist. Again, uh, we'd like to see uh, more recent data and we're, have some concerns about how good this data is because of some of the problems that, uh, that the CPS has in terms of measurement, but this is a fairly persistent number that we get. 
we're looking at that joblessness. One way to measure it is to see what's happened with the Asian American labor force. And you can see it jumped around. You can see that that fall in the labor force uh, at the end of March, beginning of April was quite large, which is why we had a big joblessness number. It was been actually fairly slow to increase, uh, kind of re got restored by the end of August, but then again, started to dip. I think it will be one of the things we want to look at as um, this kind of next wave of the pandemic hits, what will happen to both the uh, Asian American labor force and the unemployment rates uh, over the next couple of months. You can see that, uh, remember those three industries, the hospitality and leisure, retail and other services, they were hard hit. Uh, we note that uh, Asian Americans were employed in these industries to a, a, in very large numbers. And we can see that the unemployment rates for Asians in these three industries continues to be higher than that of non-Hispanic whites. And again, uh, if looking at the, the May June figures of 30% unemployment in these sectors, that is a something that is troubling on many levels. Again, kind of indicative of who is being affected by this. Uh, it's going to be the uh, lower wage workers, the, the workers that are less likely to have resources to uh, weather the pandemic. Looking at self-employment. Uh, there, the only thing that you really need to get out of this graph is the following. If you look at that top brown line, that's kind of the non-Hispanic white self-employment or measure of small business that we've been using. And we can see that actually it's kind of gone back up to the pre-pandemic levels by September. Again, that we had two measures and both measures seem to show recovery for non-Hispanic whites. But for Asians, we see that we are continuing to fall off from the, from the, the March figures and that the, the self-employment rates have actually fallen during this particular period of time. Um, Paul and I have done a little bit of work on this to try to again match up with different sources. And so we see that in September, there's actually some uh, dispute. We're using some other data, which says that maybe instead of a downward term, it, it's kind of stable from August, but uh, that, well, official CPS uh, survey shows that Asian American businesses haven't recovered at all from the, the onset of the pandemic. And again, yes. uh, oh, I was just to say that, that your point, Don, is also consistent with what we see using the smartphone data, that the recovery is much slower and that the level of economic activities uh, as measured by pedestrian traffic to stores, remain lower than the recovery for other businesses. Well, here's the, the same story in terms of a percent change. And if you look at the non-Hispanic white ones, uh, they're almost recovered from uh, the February numbers. However, the uh, Asian uh, small businesses, self-employed continues to be uh, below that and something on the order of 6% at this point in time. Anyway, uh, hopefully we haven't been totally bored by all those graphs. Economists love graphs, but we wanted to actually give a quick summary and, and talk about policy and some of the future research that we're working on. Again, no surprise, Asian American unemployment jobless rates greater than whites over the course of the pandemic the concern is whether this is going to be a permanent feature of the labor market. Uh, there's many uh, issues about kind of causes of it. We've tried to put forth some of the reasons why uh, Asian American unemployment is high. Uh, we know that Asian Americans make up a large portion of UI claimants. So this of course has some impact on policy. We know that Asian Americans are a large share of workers in industries that have been heavily impacted by COVID-19. And we see that Asian American businesses were hit hard early by the pandemic and are very slow to recover. Uh, bottom line, this is something that we talk about with various people and it says, we have to remember that we're talking about the disadvantaged group of Asians being heavily impacted, I, I think most heavily impacted uh, by the pandemic economically. 
And finally, these are a list of policy recommendations that shouldn't be surprising, extend federal and state UI benefits. Again, the Asians are collecting a lot of these, uh, are, are collecting UI benefits and with uh, many of the federal programs that are cutting back on the extended UI programs. And then given that we're moving into another phase of the pandemic, this is something that I think everybody should be able to support. Looking at the paycheck protection programs and economic injury dislocation loan programs for small businesses to also be extended. Again, state and local government policies would also be put in place in, in addition to the federal uh, uh, programs. We are a little concerned that maybe Paul can speak about this, about whether the those parts of the population that are lower income, non-English speaking, uh, are they actually making use of all these programs that exist out there? And I think some of the research that Paul's been doing is saying that maybe that answer isn't as, they haven't been fully using these programs. Paul, you have some yeah. so, insight. Uh, <laughs> The, the, two, the two major programs is unemployment insurance enhancement and extension. And one of the issues Don mentioned is that not everybody's eligible for UI. And people could apply, or some people don't even apply because they're not eligible, or they don't know they're eligible. But we are also looking at among those who apply, you know, we see that Asian American workers many of them, a fairly high percentage, are not receiving unemployment insurance. And so it doesn't appear that everybody who's been displaced, who's Asian American, are able to take advantage of the CARES Act. Uh, you may have heard about the payroll uh, protection program. And there are already two problems people talked about. One is extensive fraud. So there are these fake companies, people applying, you know, and sometimes idiots going on Twitter saying that they got money and they get arrested. But that aside, the amount of fraud is actually fairly extensive in the PPP. The other one is that big businesses, bigger ones, are essentially taking a disproportionate share of the loans. Uh, best estimate is about 5% of the businesses, the big ones, are taking nearly half of the loans. So it's not trickling down to the mom and pop stores, the community shops, and so forth. Uh, we just completed an analysis that will be released next week. And what we find is that particularly in ethnic enclaves and in minority communities, they are receiving disproportionately far fewer dollars to support the businesses there. And so we see the systematic failure in a number of these relief programs along racial lines, along class lines. And I do hope we have a second wave of stimulus package, but I hope that we can resolve and correct some of the real structural flaws in the way we are handling the relief uh, if that's an indicator or a harbinger of what's going to come, when we get into the recovery, you know, I would fear that we again will see these systematic disparities that disadvantage uh, those who've been most hit hard, but are pretty much outside of the mainstream. And we should move forward. We should all participate in this. And we should be guided by the fact that at least the research that we've been doing and our colleagues been doing shows that there are huge systemic racial inequality that must be addressed. Thank you for that elaboration, Paul. Uh, <laughs> a couple of things uh, also mentioned. Uh, this is a period of time where the economy may actually be going through a transformation. Some of the jobs that have been heavily impacted by uh, COVID might not reappear again. Uh, if you think about a couple of things, like some of the uh, small Asian businesses that employ workers, like your restaurants or some of your cleaning establishments, nail salons, they might not exist anymore. So it may 
be useful to think about transitioning workers uh, from some of these industries into others with some job scale programs. These are uh, uh, suggestions from uh, uh, other uh, parts of the, the kind of e the economics profession of what could be done. And again, if things get very bad, it may be time to consider some of those Depression era type jobs and infrastructure programs that existed in the 1930s. Uh, there are a number of economic studies saying, well, how bad is this going to be? How long is this going to last? In fact, it was a project that I gave to some of my uh, economic history students. And if it becomes prolonged, we may have to start to consider some of these types of policies. Again, future research, the, pan the pandemic continues to unfold. We're entering a kind of dark period again with more shutdowns. So we kind of looked at the initial impact. Are we gonna see those high levels of unemployment again? Are we going to see some uh, restructuring of the economy? Again, these are some things that are, have yet to be determined yet, let alone what kind of data we have to look at it. Uh, Paul's mentioned that you know, there's other projects that I, I know Paul and some of our colleagues are working on to look at what we call the census pulse data, uh, the census and a couple other uh, organizations with it, within the federal government commissioned a kind of uh, almost weekly, bi-weekly special census to look at the impact of uh, the pandemic on things like jobs, uh, health, uh, food security, uh, housing security and health security. And so there's some, uh, a wealth of data from that particular project. Paul's been using a lot of big data, uh, looks like the cell phone uh, data as a way to try to get at what's going on with respect to uh, this uh, pandemic and its impact. Again, there's other topics I know that Paul has been working really hard and he's been frazzled over such things as the a discussion of the dig, digital divide and, and what impact that has for different groups in terms of education, looking at food and, and uh, shelter security issues. Uh, Paul and I and others were trying to maybe look at these uh, issues with a little bit more sophisticated analysis, kind of more in the academic area to, to look at the effects of, uh, of what's going on in the pandemic. And also we wanted to look at uh, what effects may be due to increasing discrimination because we're certainly in an era where discrimination is kind of a, a larger issue and that uh, we want to see if there was some way to get at that particular issue. Uh, again, longer term effects in economics, we, in labor economics, we have all these kinds of odd terms and one of them is labor scarring. And so what's the impact of being uh, unemployed or out of the labor force during a pandemic going to be? How does it affect your earnings in the future? There's a, a wealth of literature talking about how large spells of unemployment uh, affect workers who are young workers, older workers in terms of their future earnings ability. So it's something that we would like to look at too. Again, increasing structural unemployment. Will small businesses recover? I, I think that Paul may have some other things to add about some future research that he's working on. Yeah, I, I, uh, the only thing I would mention is that I think it's important for those of us in the academy uh, to be actively participating uh, in the research on these issues. It is quite likely that this is a pivotal moment and there are these massive changes. Uh, Don and I certainly focus on the economic aspects, but there are other, I think, fundamental changes that will be occurring to our other institutions and in terms also in terms of social relationships and political relationships. And if we do not become actively engaged, be uh, engaged scholars in this process, then I think it's gonna be very hard to come up with solutions that are both at the policy level which quite often tinkers on the margin, 
but also solutions that hopefully we could tackle the much larger structural inequality, what people talk about in terms of systemic racism. Uh, so I would encourage people on this uh, webinar to see if there are ways to transform your work uh, by focusing on this pivotal moment. Anyway, I think uh, that finishes Hong I's discussion. I think we told Michael that we like to get started in 40 minutes, but I don't think we succeeded. But anyway, Michael, maybe you can jump in at this point. Sure, that was great. That's a lot of data. And you're right, as Don said, economists love graphs. Uh, but um, I really do appreciate your sort of summary comments and, and trying to figure this out. And I also want to invite um, uh, the audience as well to submit any questions you may have uh, through the um, Q&A function on our Zoom webinar. And, and let me start there. I mean, there's a, a, a bunch of issues on the table, I'm sure. Um, but one person asks, uh, are you seeing the underpinnings of an Asian American underclass in light of the uh, prolonged global pandemic, which arguably has had a greater negative social economic impact on the greater Asian American community? And if so, are there structural solutions? I think you spoke to this about education, for example, and how um, that becomes a sort of crucial variable in defining among Asian Americans who is mostly hard hit by, um, by the economic consequences of this. But are we seeing the underpinnings of an Asian American underclass? It depends how, you know, economists often don't use the same language as sociologists. And there's nothing wrong with being a sociologist. <laughs> but oh, we speak a Don't we get speak us into a, trouble, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> we speak a different language. What we do know is during this pandemic that there is a growing inequality. There's a huge divide, first of all, between those who are impacted by job displacement, business losses, and so forth. And there are some who are actually doing very well. You know, if you happen to be privileged by being a professor in an institution that continues to operate and pays your paycheck, or uh, if you're in these big companies where you could do remote learning, I mean, not remote, remote work, where your paycheck continues to come in, there is this divide. We already had a huge class economic divide in terms of wealth and income before the pandemic. Uh, most of the research shows that this divide is becoming much greater during the pandemic. We know that's the case. We know it, the data that Don show, as well as other people's data, it's really those who with less education, uh, people of color, uh, traditionally vulnerable populations, they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of it. And so in one sense, the problem of growing class divide has become greater. The next question is that, will that become more permanent? Will the so class divide, economic divide, racial divide now take on a characteristics that lasts well beyond the pandemic? Mm -hmm. My fear is the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way, uh, the ethnic economy, the ethnic businesses, if you were out of business with no revenues for long periods of time, much longer than other businesses, your, your chances of recovery is much lower because you're up to your neck in debt. If you are the workers for these businesses, you are suffering long periods of unemployment, no paycheck. Uh, a, Current research that we're doing right now, for example, we've compared the businesses that are still operating during the pandemic over the last two months. Uh, so these are not the businesses that failed. But when we compare Asian American businesses with non-Hispanic white businesses, what is surprising is that the proportion of Asian American businesses that have financial problems is significantly larger. Uh, they're having problems paying their rent or their mortgage for their home. 
we believe that also translate into problems of paying rent or mortgage for their businesses. Uh, much higher proportion are not being able to meet the monthly financial needs to pay for food and so forth. And Don talked about this long-term scar that economists think about. That is, you know, what you lose during the pandemic is not just temporary or transitional. It has, based on past research, really leaves a mark on people. So we're seeing a widening divide in terms of class. And part of that will undoubtedly uh, continue in terms of the scarring. Now, the question is, what can we do about it? And I would like to be op optimistic about that. Uh, that's why we're in this game of trying to do this research to inform people about the problem. But more than just informing them, we're trying to shape politics and policy. That whatever we do in the recovery, you know, it has to address you know, structural inequality. You sort of touched on this already. One person was asking too about how we might be able to address the um, small business and, and residential rental situation. Talk about they know several restaurants have been not able to pay rent since March of 2020 uh, and that many of them will in fact go under. What could be possibly done? We are um, gonna drop off the cliff at the end of December. A uh, temporary moratorium on rent and to a certain degree on mortgages for those who are fortunate to own a home, those temporary moratoriums ends it roughly around end of December. Uh, some local jurisdictions may have, are extending it, but by and large, that's gonna hit us hard. So come January, we are nationwide having millions and in California, it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Our best estimate for Los Angeles is maybe up to a quarter million. People who are behind on their rent, they're no longer protected by ordinances from being evicted. And I can't see how these people, given that there's still gonna be unemployment, low wages and so forth, how they're able to catch up on their debt. We're seeing the same problem in terms of businesses. You know, you, if you don't have revenues coming in, but you still have to pay rent, the only thing you could do is beg your landlord, you know, I will try to catch up next month or the month after that. And what we're seeing is that many of these ministers are accumulating huge amount of debt. Mm. And again, actually businesses are less protected by temporary moratoriums on evictions. Uh, there are efforts to do that. San Francisco has been very active. Los Angeles has been very active trying to enact ordinance to protect them, but these are temporary protections. We don't know what happens uh, beginning early next year. So I think there's a huge crisis looming out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, actually, I just wanted to say, follow up again. It's a large amount of funding that would be necessary to support these small businesses and to, to ameliorate this kind of uh, housing problem of uh, not paying rent, uh, past mortgage due, these types of issues. And, and this is something I don't think that's been fully addressed uh, by many of the programs that we see that have been proposed at the federal level. All right. Uh, so with respect to uh, the strata of workers, um, a, a person asked, what kind of job opportunities are likely to be available to lower wage, lower skilled API workers that they might be able to transition into? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> that, that's the, the, the discussion of maybe some job skill training programs that might necessarily be in there. I mean, I, I have some preliminary research that says something to the effect of uh, Asian small businesses actually ameliorating some of the unemployment situation. Maybe it's time to look at developing businesses maybe that can make use of existing skills or do skills that might be able to be uh, 
contained easily. There's some discussion maybe sometimes of some types of simple manufacturing, like assembly of things. Uh, there's, again, can we do anything about um, the, the diversifying the services that Asians are employed in? And again, this is a problem that's been very difficult to address. Uh, look at Hawaii, how you diversify them out of the hotel leisure management type area. Again, but I think uh, training, education, these types of issues might be some things that, that can be done. I, I think there, I fully agree with uh, Professor Marr, but I think one of the things that we all want to think about is what do, what may be really doable. Much of what we're talking about and much of what I talk about sort of is on the margins. It's how do you deal with a problem? Uh, one would hope that there could be larger a vision of what we want to do, which requires massive change. You know, do we want to, for example, guarantee a universal income? You know, and that would protect people. Do we want to really tax uh, that very high, the very rich, particularly if they don't earn their additional income and their wealth because of imperfections in the market because of uh, monopoly uh, actions? Do we want to address some of these larger structural problems. Uh, on a good night, I think they're possible. On a bad night, you know, I see it being you know, disheartening. But I think we need to do both. We need to think about pragmatic solutions along policy levels. But I think we really need to hammer away at some of these larger questions about structural changes. You know, land ownership in terms of housing, in terms of you know, stores and so forth, urban land markets are among the most imperfect markets that we have. It generates unfair wealth and transfer of income from one group to another. Do we have the will to address that? You know, are we gonna pull back from Prop 13? That's a mild one, but even that is challenging. So I think it's important for us to think at sort of the immediate policy level, but I think there are larger structural questions that we need to really address. All right, thank you. I'm afraid I'm gonna have to draw this to a close. And I do wanna thank Don Moore and Paul Long for their insightful presentation. And uh, I know it's been difficult where to pitch the presentation given some of the technical issues involved in some of the data you presented, but certainly do uh, appreciate your summary and your policy recommendations. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks to Deborah Lustig, the Associate direct, uh, Director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, the home of ARC, and uh, Lisa Harai Tuchitani with uh, the Asian American Research Center, and really to our producer at ISSI, uh, Max uh, Vandervalker. Thank you all, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.